Okay, first of all, uh, the reason for this interview in a nutshell is that AJ, you believe that you were Jesus, and Mary, you believe that you were Mary Magdalene. And you've both admitted to a lot of people that when hearing this, they would probably think you're just clearly deluded. <laughs> so can you please explain how you arrived at this understanding? Um, yes. Well, Jeff, firstly, we don't believe we were Mary Magdalene or Jesus, but we believe we are. Um, and I suppose that is the beginning of the first set of circumstances we need to explain, and that is we believe that people, people have one life, not many lives, and, and so therefore when you're born first on earth, usually your parents name you, and in my case in the first century my parents named me Yeshua, and, and then you grow and certain things happen to you in your life. So in my life I grew and certain things happened in my earth-based life, and then I, I died, as, as many do. I didn't die the same way that a lot of people died, but I died. And then I passed into the spirit world and I was still the same person. And then I progressed through the spirit world, uh, still as the same person, but just developing in, uh, and growing, just like any person does. And, and then we got to a point where both Mary and myself started re recognising that we were one soul and not two separate individual souls. And that's something that we recognised before we passed you know, from the earth in the first century. But um, And then Mary was born in the first century in the same manner and, and she had a life in the first century and she died and then she arrived in the spirit world and she continued to progress just the same and we progressed together recognising that we were a part of the same soul, which we call soul mates, I suppose, but the reality is we're one soul in two bodies, if you like. and. And then we recognised after that development continued that we had an opportunity to return to the planet if we were willing to take on a different set of bodies. We had an opportunity to return to, plan to the planet. And so when we returned, it was just the same process, the same person, Jesus and, and Mary, um, splitting into the two separate uh, bodies, if you like, again, and, and, then, and then developing on Earth again. But but we're still the same person, it's all one life, and it has a memory of that entire life. And you've always had this memory, even as a very young child in this life? No, because you've got to understand how memories are created. Um, for every single person who's ever lived, we are selective about our memories based on our emotional condition associated with the memory. So usually what you find happening on the earth today is that when memories are associated with trauma, then generally they're quite heavily suppressed. And sometimes when memories are associated with beautiful things that you've lost, you often suppress the memory of those things as well. And then in addition, um, our day-to-day -day life sometimes isn't very eventful, and so we, even yesterday I doubt many, of us, many of us could actually recall in detail what actually happened to us yesterday unless there were some significant events that we could recall. And so with regard to memory, what happens is there has to be some emotional allowance of the memory occurring. So and how old were you when this first occurred? Well, f for me, I had some memories occur when I was around two years of age in this life, but I didn't have an emotional allowance of, of what it meant. So I had memories of somebody driving uh, nails through my feet, but I didn't have any emotional uh, way of joining that together and realising what it was, given the brain of a two-year-old is not probably capable of working out those particular things. And so that, that was the beginning of some of my memories. For Mary, I think hers were more around when she was 14 Fif or 15. Yeah, 14, 14 or 15, I think. Um, I, had, I had a specific event where I remembered um, being murdered and I remembered also being on the run for my life uh, and it was quite a big emotional um, memory uh, experience and I also didn't have any context to put that in. Did and this come out as, as in your conscious mind or in a dream? Or? Uh, no, it was. I was at a workshop, a, sort of like a personal development workshop mm -hmm. and um, really spontaneously a piece of music was played and I began to feel incredibly sad for no apparent reason and I began to sob and suddenly the details of 
um, these traumatic events were upon me um, and I spoke about them with the group I was with and, and they um, said, well, it's a past life memory and um, you, it's okay, you just need to to get on with things. And um, I didn't actually have a belief in reincarnation at the time and so I didn't put much stock in that and um, I just tried to get on with my day. We moved on to doing other activities. But for me, the grief just kept coming and coming and coming and coming for a good six hours and beyond that, I just kind of filed it in that I don't understand yeah. a category of Until my life. Until when? Until I met AJ, probably. Okay. Although not immediately after I met AJ, because when I met AJ, I was fairly um, sceptical, I think is probably the, the correct uh, term. I was very, I resonated incredibly with what he was speaking about. In fact, it was bizarre because I felt, almost as if I understood what he was talking about before he explained it. Mm. Um, and we had many conversations in the beginning of our relationship where we'd be discussing an issue and I'd sort of be saying, oh, yeah, and isn't all this obvious? Like, uh, doesn't everyone see this? And and he would point out, and there was a lot of evidence for the fact that, no, no not everyone does believe or see this. Um so when I met AJ, I was really attracted to what he was talking about, but I wished he'd stop telling people he was Jesus because I felt that really damaged the impact, the the believability, if you like, mm. and how open people were to responding to it. You really had the approach, didn't you, that that if if you could convince me to that I wasn't Jesus, then everything would be fine. Then. Yeah, it was a fairly arrogant approach, actually. Uh, it didn't really put a lot of... Um, stock in how much you'd actually gone through to get to a, a point to be able to say it to people. Yeah. Mm. So, AJ, how did your mother react when when you um, came out, so to speak? Yeah, probably it would have been sort of four or five months after I... What, what happened, I obviously I had a series, you know, so now we're jumping ahead nearly from two years of age to 38 or to, to nearly 40 years of age. So, so now there's a fair bit of life in that little gap mm. uh, where a lot of different things occurred, um, you know, that were memories, again, that, that, I, that I couldn't accept and I couldn't explain. And so what I did was very similar to what Mary did when she was 15, and that is just slot it in the background and say, well, I don't know anything about that. I didn't believe in reincarnation the way it was portrayed by, you know, people on the planet today. And so, and I felt quite strongly that the teaching of reincarnation had a lot of unloving basis as to it, therefore could not be truth. And so um, I just slotted, like Mary did, a lot of the events in the background and just sort of left it for another day to resolve, basically. And it wasn't until I was around uh, nearly 40 that um, I started having a lot stronger memories uh, and recollections of events throughout my life in the first century and in the spirit world and in this life and I, and I started to actually take them a bit more seriously and start documenting them and 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 not in documenting them, but processing them through them emotionally like accepting them emotionally and um, and after about sort of that that process began in earnest around 2003 2004 um, and and after about five months of it, I was fairly convinced that I knew who I was. In fact, it wasn't the memories that convinced me. It was just, uh, it wasn't like there was a necessary for conviction even. It was just, this is who I am, sort of a feeling. It's a bit like you coming to terms with the fact. Let's say that you, um, and this is probably a poor example, but let's say that you uh, had some kind of inheritance that you weren't aware of and then someone came along and told you that actually you know the parents that you have now they were actually um they were actually your foster parents and your real parents were such and such and and those two parents uh, would like to meet you and and get to know you and so forth you'd probably go through you know a fair bit of turmoil in that sort of transition where you, you, you sort of start doubting what, you know, your own experience to a degree and you start working your way through who is my mum and dad and who, who are, what's the reality and all those kind of things. But after a period of time, 
of working your way through that emotionally, you'd come to terms with the fact that, yes, you had these real parents and and there was proof and evidence to support that, but, but you were so adopted So what's out. made you certain beyond a doubt that these memories are correct? Because there's a lot of stuff in the media about repressed memories not being correct memories and being, you know, that our minds have the ability to fabricate things from different experiences and... Totally, I agree with that. And, and that our memories are, can't really be relied upon. Um, what makes, what has given you the certainty um, the real memory is not the memory of the events, but rather the memory of who I am. It's a bit like somebody coming along and telling you, Jeff, that you're somebody else. No matter how much they try to uh, brainwash you into believing you're somebody else, at some point in time in the future you'd probably come to terms with what life you've actually had and who you actually are as a result of that particular life you've led. And that's really what's happened for myself. There's nothing unique about the process. It's just that I've um, I've just remembered a lot of my life now that I didn't remember before because of different emotional reasons that I had to, to suppress it. And when I was uh, uh, no longer willing to suppress those particular memories, they just rose quite naturally. And as a result of that, now I remember my, you know, my, almost all of my life for the last 2,000 years. And there's still gaps in it that are due to further suppression that I have of some particular memories that I'm aware of. But but I could tell you, you know, pretty... It would take quite a few weeks to give you a bit of a summary of my life over mm. that period of time, obviously. But but I could give you a pretty concise summary of all the things that have occurred in my life over that period. Yeah. yeah. And, and it conflicts in some ways with the biblical account, doesn't it? Of course. I, like I, I even have memories of watching the biblical account being modified to suit the people who modified it in terms of to suit power and manipulation of people and so forth. Um, so not only do I have the memories of my life, but also the memories of watching people modify the account of my life to suit their own ends. So um, you've got memories of the spirit world as well. Hmm. Yeah, and what we did in the spirit world and so forth. Yeah. And and and, and how I arrived and what I did after I arrived and what I did when Mary, you know, before while Mary was still on Earth, because because I I passed before Mary did. And uh, what we did until our children passed, um, our, our child passed. And and then what we did after that. As so well. when when you were in the first century, you had a daughter. Is mm. that, that correct? Yeah, the, she wasn't born uh, uh, when I when I died. No, you Mary said was, she was pregnant. Yeah, about six months pregnant. Yeah, mm. and Mary gave birth to her after I passed. Yeah, and you have a memory of watching this from the spirit world. Yeah, all take place. Yeah, yeah. Mary was in Egypt at the time, and gave birth to Sarah in Egypt. Yeah. 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 Well, Mary, this puts you in a fairly unique position because n I haven't met anybody else who has a memory of the spirit world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's it like? Well, it depends where you are in the spirit world as to what it is like. Um, a lot of people uh, from Earth arrive in the spirit world in quite a dark condition. And when I say dark condition, what I'm doing is referring to their condition of love. So, in other words, in the spirit world, um, it's your condition of love, that, of love that determines where you arrive and how you generally progress thereafter. And so if a person has a poor condition of love well, on earth where they've used their will on earth to attack others, to harm others and, and to cause harm to the environment and so forth, then what happens is that when they pass, they're in a fairly poor condition of love and their environment in the spirit world matches their condition. And so for the majority of people who pass, they pass into what's called the first sphere or the first dimension of the spirit world. And the first dimension ranges from very, very terrible conditions, which match what, what uh, Dante's description of hell, for example, um, and, and even worse uh, than that, complete darkness, uh, desolation, no love right the way through to what's called the top of the first sphere, which is, a, which is a location called Summerland, which is where many children arrive. And that could be likened to a place that's the most beautiful place you can imagine here on Earth. So that, that's the first dimension. The, the different levels of the first dimension range between those particular conditions. 
And uh, the average person on Earth passes into one location in the first dimension on in the spirit world. And that's dependent upon what? Their Primarily, their as I said, their development in love. So how much they understand love and, and, and practice, practice it, it in their day-to-day -day life. Um, it's got nothing to do with religious background, racial background, as, you know, gender background, nothing to do with what kind of uh, life you led in terms of what society believed about you or felt about you. It's got everything to do with what in reality is love from God's perspective. It's God that set up the universal system and so therefore it's God's laws that are, that are enacted, not man's. And so quite often people feel that they're in a good condition of love, but when they pass into the spirit world, they, they soon come to terms with the fact, for many, they soon come to terms with the fact that they're not in, in as good condition of love as what they believed. There are very few people who pass into the second sphere in the spirit world or the second dimension. And historically, there's only been a few people that have ever passed into the third dimension of the spirit world. Can you give world. some examples? Um, Gandhi passed into the third sphere of the spirit world. Um, into the third dimension um, directly. Um, there were historically um, some of the people who you would like, who, well, they're mostly unknowns, people that you wouldn't, um, that the average person wouldn't know because they've lived very mundane lives on earth and mm. lived very normal, what would be classified as normal lives on earth. Often it's the people who've lived famous lives on earth who pass into the first condition in quite a in, into the first sphere in quite a poor condition because they had a lot of addictions in play many of them and uh, and also had a lot of um a lot of intentions that weren't based on love so so the afterlife is as you see it is a it's like people who pass into the hells as you call it mm -hmm. that's not a position of permanency of forever no. torment but that's a transitional period and they everyone has every soul has the chance to progress is that correct? that's correct yeah so every soul every person no matter where they are whether they're here on earth or in the spirit world have the chance to progress out of their condition and the amount of desire they have to do that or the, what i would classify as the exercise of their free will you know how much they want to do it will determine on how fast they move from one dimension to the next. Unfortunately, on Earth here, there are a lot of impediments, social impediments, to progressing beyond a certain condition. Because the more your condition of love is out of harmony with the world's condition, um, the more generally you're attacked. And this is why the majority of people on Earth finish up staying in a certain condition until they pass, because there is this general uh, weight of the world which prevents the person from growing in further conditions of love without, uh, because of their own fear of being attacked, uh, sort of causes them to stagnate, if you like. And so there's many people on earth with good intentions, and I'd say there's billions of people on earth with good intentions, but unfortunately um, our unhealed emotions cause us to be very afraid of different things, and particularly afraid of violence and, and attack. And since we're afraid of a violence and attack, we then have a tendency to stagnate in our development to a certain point of love. Once we go beyond that point, there's a higher likelihood of us being attacked or, or being treated violently. And as a result of that, we have a tendency to stay at a certain point where we've grown to a certain point of love, but don't have the courage to, to make the next step into a greater condition of love. And that's what is the biggest impediment here on Earth, the general projection of, a, of the environment towards an individual who attempts to grow beyond the condition of love that the average person experiences. Now you talk about people as the soul, as coming into the Earth's environment as a sort of duality, a, a female and male. Uh, not not always, always female and male, yeah. But feminine and masculine. Uh, not no. always, no. no. Um, the soul itself, the complete soul, when it's amalgamated, has a combination of feminine and masculine qualities. But the soul, when it splits, has three potential ways of splitting. One way of splitting is for one half to be male and the other half to be female. In other words, one half to be dominantly masculine in qualities and therefore attract a masculine body. And the other half to be dominantly feminine in qualities and therefore attract a feminine body. 
then the other alternative is that the soul has more femininity in it as a total. As a personality. As a personality. And when it splits, one half splits with the fair dominance of femininity, so that goes into a female body, and the other half splits into uh, with the dominance of feminine qualities into a female body. The third alternative is that the soul is dominantly masculine, even though it does have some feminine qualities, and if that happens, then generally the soul will split into a dominant, one half will split into a dominantly masculine and therefore be attracted to a dominantly masculine body, a male body, and the other half is dominantly masculine, so it will also attract a masculine body. So they are the th three potential ways that the so soul. So Mary is your soul mate. So is her soul development exactly the same as yours? No. <laughs> can, can I answer that? Yeah, mm. I'd like to answer that. No. Um, so for every soul um, as it splits, so every soul splits at the time of incarnation and ourselves we reached a certain development in love which meant that we could reincarnate for want of a better term and we split again. Can I just explain that when we reached that unified condition, we did have exactly the same uh, development in love because that's the only way that you can unify yeah. by having the same development in love. Yeah. But then for, for any half of a soul, if you like, for yourself, equally myself at this time and, and AJ at this time, um, we're all impacted upon by the environment which we grow up our connection to God is also limited by those things uh, or encouraged depending on the uh, upbringing that we have and so my soul development which is the development of my soul how I classify it is in terms of love and for myself in terms of connection with God because I have a strong passion for God. our soul each soul has its own personality so our, our soul's personality has a strong desire for God which is part of the reason why historically we're noted for for that uh, or at least you are um, mm. so at incarnation or reincarnation the personality remains intact of the soul however the life experience then begins to affect the soul condition so for myself and AJ we've grown up in completely different families um, and so and had different experiences, uh, had different levels of openness to God and emotion according to the family life that we were in this time. And so um, at this stage, AJ's soul development in love is greater than my own, um, but that's not necessarily always going to be the case, but it is at this time. Does that answer your question well? And, and it's not because of anything that I have intrinsically that's different than Mary. It's only because we've had different opportunities. And I, I began the process of clearing away the errors of my soul uh, uh, quite a number of years before Mary began the process. So I, I sort of had a head start in terms of the process of clearing away the errors in my soul in this life, mm. which really for me began probably close to 15 years ago now in terms of the processes I, I was involved in whereas for Mary it really probably begun four years ago yeah so maximum. probably three really yeah. yeah so so it's just that if Mary had begun 15 years ago and I'd begun four years ago then our situation would be reversed you know where Mary would be in a better condition of love than I would be uh, because she would have probably dealt with more emotional reasons why she wasn't loving than I ha would have w would have at this point. So mm. it just it just has depended upon our circumstances and and the different things that happened in our life that got us to the point that we where we are now. It's got nothing to do with me intrinsically being sort of better or worse than Mary or, or vice versa. It's just got to do with more to do with life's op opportunities and then what decisions were made with those particular opportunities. Yep. Mm. Yeah. Okay, just backstepping a little bit. Um, in this life, you've been a computer. You've you've been uh, you've run a successful computer company. Yeah, I've, for about twenty years, you said. Yeah, I also window cleaned and did other things too. Yeah. <laughs> and Mary, you were an occupational therapist. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Now the pageant messages, you talk about them a lot. Mm -hmm. They've had a big influence on you, or now they claim to be. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, they claim to be automatic writing mm -hmm. messages passed from yourself in the spirit world. Mm. Is that correct? In That's the correct. end of about 1920. 
Uh, just yeah, in between mm. nineteen fourteen and nineteen twenty. Yeah. And okay. not 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 just from just me. from you, from uh, many, but others. from a lot of yeah. our friends as well in the spirit world. So, can you so, explain what automatic writing is and and this channeling business that a lot of people don't quite understand or have anything any knowledge of? Sure. So, channeling is really just um, just as you and I are having a conversation. It's the ability to have a similar conversation with someone who's lost their physical body and is now in a spirit form. And so that can occur with anyone in the spirit world. We began to talk about the different levels that exist in the spirit world earlier. Mm. So anywhere from the first sphere or realm, uh, which is a lower condition of love, then say that seventh or eighth sphere, which is the transition where we become at one with God, if you like, all the way into the celestial heavens, which are all the spheres beyond there. Mm. So the process of channeling um, is having a communication with spirits in one of those realms. And do you, uh, you still currently do that? Mm. Yes. And how often do you do this? All day, most days. <laughs> all day, all day, every day. Yeah, well, you know, while, while we're sitting here, there are spirits involved in our conversation. There's spirits influencing even your questions, and they even influenced you writing down the questions that you had. And there's a lot of spirits involved in terms of uh, next to each person, in terms of guiding each person, but there's also other spirits who want to uh, influence uh, people negatively. And and in the first century, I recognised and saw that quite early in my life, and uh, I wasn't impeded as most people were by being blocked to, to those particular interactions with the spirit world. And my friend John the Baptist, he also had a strong uh, feeling for spirits, and he could see spirits as well. And so that meant that we could, myself and John, we were only six months apart in terms of age, we could often talk to spirits when mum and them, our parents weren't around and so we often learnt a lot through that process and for me that's when it began for Mary it began in the first century as well like that where she recognised communication with spirits and but I was certainly under the influence of a lot of spirits without recognition for a long time as well mm. and that is the reality for just about all of us on the planet at the moment mm. positive or negative? both, both. Okay. Mm. at all times mm. and and well, at the majority of times, yeah. Mm. Now, there's a, there's a, since the New Age movement began, there's been a lot of people claiming to have channeled a lot of historical figures. And mm. you say that a lot of these people have been deceived mm. because we really don't know who's behind the curtain, do we? It's, you know, they well, say they're somebody, but... Yeah, unless you can physically see them and also feel mm. their... Discern from a place of... Yeah, feel love. the love in the person yeah. that you're yeah. speaking to. So how do you and discern who, what you're communicating with? Well, a lot of the people we communicate with are people we knew on Earth in the first century. So, you know, they're people who have been with us most of our lives for 2,000 years. So for that reason, we know them very well and we know who we're talking to. Um, for others, it's a matter of seeing, of, of testing the spirits that come to speak. So the way that you do that is by asking them things about their life and asking them to describe their life on earth and talk to them about their individual circumstances. And in many cases, you can verify the, 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 person, uh, the person's life, you know, when they are on earth at least, and verify when they die without actually, uh, after the event of talking to them. So you can easily see whether they were person lying about those events or not. I would say there's more to it for me. Mm -hmm. Did you want yeah, to? Yeah, no, keep going. Um, uh, for myself, it requires a level of emotional openness to what it is I'm feeling and um, a dedication to my own growth in love. Uh, the more that I feel I can be discerning about my own emotional condition and, and what is truly loving and feel with honesty the emotions that are within me, the more I feel I can do that with you and also with the spirits involved. So... I'm not sure if that's probably a fairly foreign concept to most people, but mm. um, I feel that if I'm in connection with what I, it is I'm really feeling, I'm not afraid to, to feel what that is, then when I'm sitting with you, I'll also be open to what you feel. Because the, most of the, the time, the thing that blocks me being open to what you feel is something that's going to be triggered in me when I feel what you feel. Mm. Does, is that... A, mm. Yeah, and equally... Um, 
I f have the same experience with spirits. Mm. And so if a spirit comes to me full of rage and anger and I can feel that and then they try and tell me they're from a, a sphere that's quite developed in love, I immediately know that there's an there's mm. untruth yeah. being spoken. Also, yeah. also, if I can just address the other part of the question that you asked, and that is why is it that they are always famous people, that, people who are mm. channelling? And that is a very, very interesting question. And, and the main answer to that is the fact that the person on earth wants it to be a famous person <laughs> that they're channelling. And so, therefore, they are open to suggestion uh, by anybody that, you know, so it's a bit like if you couldn't see me and I came along to you and said, oh, I'm a famous person that, you know, I thought would appeal to you, and you wanted to believe that, you would just probably accept it, and then we'd have a talk on the basis of me being that famous person. And um, over a period of time, if, I, if you were open to my feelings and you started questioning me in more detail, you'd soon find out probably whether I'm speaking the truth or not over a period of time. Mm. The problem is, is that most mediums on the planet are not open to doing that because they want every single person who comes to them to be a famous person in history. And there's billions of people who have never been famous on Earth but, uh, but are, who are to. surrounding the Earth constantly mm. and who want to have their moment of fame. And so it's quite easy for them then to just falsify their, um, you know, their identity yeah. and people have in, a connection. People in spirit are really people in spirit often. <laughs> they haven't changed much from when they were on Earth. And yeah, and if they could the falsify same... something and get away with it, they yeah. will. Yeah. <laughs> now, you've... This knowledge, you've said that there's going to be earth changes in 2012. Did you have this knowledge or did you get this knowledge from... Celestial beings that have that have that have given you this knowledge, or because in about twenty years ago I read a number of different channeled uh, books that purported to have been Andronicus and all sorts of things, mm -hmm. and they also claimed of calamities that were going to happen in the late eighties and then the late nineties, and and the Jehovah's Witness as you. So I have had people say that it was going to happen in 1914. Um, this knowledge that you've got, uh, well, first of all, can you tell us what you believe is going to happen next year in 2012? Well, the interesting well, thing is that we don't have any um, what I would call um, firm time frame for events that will occur. We just have, uh, we, we just have our feelings to go by. And my feelings are often different to Mary's feelings yeah, in that particular yeah, matter. Yeah, we need to state that. And really. so my feelings, my feelings are that um, sometime over the coming few years, there are going to be fairly significant Earth-based events that are caused by a combination of events. The two events primarily that are causing it is the amount of resistance and fear on the planet that's causing mankind to take certain actions that they're taking to destroy the planet. And then the corresponding uh, force of God's love permeating through the universe in ever-increasing dosages, if you like. And the, the combination of these two factors cause events to actually occur. In fact, cause the evolution of mankind into a more positive condition. Um, and they do affect physically every single thing in the universe. So every single thing in the universe has a raised potential of evolution as God's love permeates each, each of those creations. But from what I heard you describe, it sounds you, you were, I think when you were giving a seminar in Greece, you mentioned three super volcanoes, a, well, I a shift of tectonic plates, and a, and a reversal of the polarity, and yep. and large water, and that sounded fairly dramatic. <laughs> well, but the rea remember, if you listen to that entire discussion that I had in Greece, mm. right at the start of the discussion, I put in a fairly major disclaimer, which was, I actually felt that that's what would happen. At that that's the feeling I had at this particular point in time. And while I still have those same feelings that those particular events will occur, um, that doesn't mean that there isn't a potential for them to change. Secondly... So um, you said about March or April next year at the that's time. That's what I said at the time. I said at the time, this is what I feel. But you're not so sure about that now, is that what you're saying? No, no. what I'm saying is that people ask me what I feel 
and all I can ever do is tell them what I feel at that time. So this is an intuition more than a, a message from... Yes, and I've, said, I've stated quite categorically that until I'm at one with God, mm. I cannot state for certain any particular event of what will occur in the future. It's only when you're at one with God that you can do so with any degree of accuracy. Now, you, you said that it took you till about the age of 30 to be at one with God in your first incarnation. Yes. When, when uh, and you say that you're a work in progress at the moment. Yes. When do you believe that time is going to come? Well, in the first century, what happened was that you know, I was about 18 years of age when I started to contemplate that I was possibly the Messiah that was foretold in the Bible that I'd, you know, in the parts of the Bible that I'd read at the time. It wasn't called the Bible then, obviously. It was the books of the prophets that we used to read as Jews. And, and after reading my way through those and having a deep interest in those for many years of my life in the first century, by the time I was 18, I started to contemplate that perhaps... I might be that particular Messiah that was spoken of. And by the time I was 21, I was quite certain that I was that person. But I realised that I had to do quite a lot of development in love to become that person. And so it took me around, if you take from 18 to 31 years of age, was when I became at one with God in the first century. In that, so it took me 13 years, if you like, for me to become at one with God in the first century after having a concept of what that meant uh, inside of myself. And you claim that you were the first human being to have ever done that? Yes, the uh, first per person in this planet to have ever done that, yes. Um, I do feel that there are persons on other planets who have done that, mm. uh, and there was always a first. It's a bit like there's a, there's a first person to discover flight, and there's a first person to discover yeah. all sorts of scientific endeavours, if you like. And so you can see yourself working towards this same state yes. in this life. Yes. So uh, it was only about eight years ago that I recognised um, and had the memories of who, who I was returned to me and also then uh, recognised within myself the desire to become at one with God again in that same sign of condition. And so for the last eight years I've been working towards that goal. And if it takes me another eight years, um, I wouldn't be disappointed. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, mm. so, um, there... Now, when you were in this state... In the first century, you had a reputation of being a healer and a miracle worker. Is this is this true? Well, parts of it were true. Um, there were certain things that it was claimed that I did that I didn't actually do, um, and but there were certain things that I certainly did do. Um, but that only occurred after I became at one with God, and it was dependent upon God. It wasn't it wasn't something that I could do at my own. Uh, well, really? well, at my own choice, if you like, it, because my but because my choices were in harmony with God's. When you become at one with God, your choices are in harmony with God's. It meant that my choice was the same as God's choice, and under those circumstances, I could heal if the person who was who was being healed also had a desire to be healed. So if they didn't have a desire to be healed, uh, and and it had to be a true desire that they felt in their heart, not a not just an intellectual desire, then I couldn't heal them anyway. If you contrast it, I mean, um, it's possible for me, to, or for you, to heal me right now. There just has to be a certain set of conditions, and that is that you are in harmony with God's desire for that healing to happen, and that I am in a place of openness and faith for that to happen. Now, because... At the time, AJ was completely in harmony with God's desires. When he healed someone, he could always heal them. Hmm. Um, but but I didn't heal everyone I met because no. it depended upon their condition, their, their desire. And so their... even crippled, blind, mm -hmm. um, those stories in the Bible? All those stories involving cripples and blind people and other physical ailments, including loss of limbs and all of those stories, are all true. But all the stories involving what I would call supernatural feats um, were not true. No. So, for example, the, the claim that I turned water into wine, for example, is not true. And the walking on the water? You didn't uh, no, go didn't. skiing that day? No, I didn't walk on water, although I do believe... Did you find fish over the other side of the boat in more uh, Yes, but that's quite quantity. simple. Uh, because all you have to do is have the psychic ability to have a spirit tell you that this is where the fish are. You didn't and, calm the waters? 
Um, or did you calm the disciples? Well, both, probably. <laughs> um, the reality is you can calm your environment through your emotions. So the reality is the one reason why the Earth is experiencing a lot of quite difficult environmental events is because of the fear of the people on the Earth. And if you reduce the fear of people on the Earth, then the environment responds differently to the soul of the people on the Earth. So the reality is, is if you calm the individual at a soul level, then the environment around them also calms. And that's something that God created as a part of the truth of the, the environment we live in. And that can be demonstrated scientifically, and that's one of the things I'd certainly hope to demonstrate in the future scientifically. Um, so there are some truths that are presented in the scriptures about what I did, and then there are some falsifications that tried to make me more powerful than I was in order to compare me with other, mm. with other people who yeah. had likewise been lied about about what they did yeah. uh, in order to make it more palatable for different people to become Christian. But also this concept, there was this concept that they couldn't, uh, many people couldn't understand the degree of love that I displayed. And so then, then began treating me as if I was some divine individual uh, or God rather than just a person who was at one with God or, or who had learnt from God. And so, so yeah. that, that was part of the problem. It was, a, this mis it was the misconception of people as well of what it meant to be at one with God. Yeah. Mm. So, so in the future... I, I just wanted to say that this is really integral to... Um, to why we're here and why we are here in the way that we are, mm -hmm. um, why there's not just one of us, <laughs> mm -hmm. why there's in, in fact 14 of us, um, all coming from a condition of quite perceptible error <laughs> um, in, in our lives prior to now and even now. Um, it's quite easy to see that we're not perfect individuals, perfected in love. But the purpose of doing so and doing so now, apparently increasingly more publicly, um, is to demonstrate that it's not because uh, Jesus is God that that he was so amazing, that this potential exists within every soul that God has created. Mm -hmm. And um, that's, that's really... Um, a, a lot of people ask us about our identities mm -hmm. and a lot of people are fascinated or dubious or attacking even about this process of memory mm. and while I feel it's valid to ask all of those questions I also feel that uh, there are other questions that I hope become more prevalent in people that follow on from there about mm. Mm. why is this so and uh, why would you do this and and because uh, that's really the basis of why we're here um, and mm. I understand that it's shocking and people need to ask about or people want to ask about these things but I, I look forward to the day when uh, people ask more about God and about love because that's certainly what we're passionate about. Yeah, the reality for both of us is that the Jesus and Mary Magdalene thing is not that, Im we feel it's, is not yeah. that important to anybody else but ourselves. So your message is the more important thing. Of course. It's like, it's like your identity mm. is really important to yourself. Mm. Like you are who you are. Well, I, I guess and... it's important for this interview yeah. in that there is much scepticism about obviously what you claim and you expect that. Of course. Yes. And, and yeah. so I'm trying to address that scepticism. Yeah. Can I, but, can I point but, out, though, that you, when I met you, you came up to me and said that you were Jeff, and I didn't, dis I didn't have scepticism about your claim. No. <laughs> no. So, so the main purpose of the scepticism is because of my claim that I'm Jesus. It's not. Yeah. Which, it's like if I was saying that I was just Alan John Miller and, I, and I'm claiming I'm Alan John Miller, everyone's fine with that. But as soon mm. as I claim that I'm Jesus, that's when everybody becomes sceptical. And, in, and to some well, degree. Well, I guess because a lot of people regard Jesus, the historical Jesus, as being probably the most influential character of the last 2,000 years. Yeah. And when someone comes along and says, hey, I'm him, mm -hmm. you know, I guess we have the right to say, well, I need a little bit of proof here, you know. Um, I, I wouldn't say that... I, I don't know about the right. <laughs> um, I feel it's natural to desire t to discern whether it's truth or not. Uh, and we're perfectly and happy to answer any questions associated with it, but, but if a person demands of us the right, no. then, then, then I feel that, that they're a bit out of line, really. No, that's fine. Um, the, the, the reality is that 
um, it will soon become apparent whether what we're claiming to be is true or not. You know, so, you know, if somebody comes and visits us in 10 years' time and we haven't progressed beyond what we are today and we haven't done yeah. anything more than what we have done today, then I'm sure people would be very sceptical. The other problem that people have, I feel, when it comes to the claim of being Jesus is, is that they, they expect, they, they remember the Jesus who was 31 years old onwards. In other words, they know nothing of me before that time. The only other record of me in the Bible is when I was 12 years old, and even mm -hmm. that was incorrect. So, you know, there's my birth and the few months after my birth that's recorded. Then there's a gap of 12 years, and then I'm 12, and there's a, one event that was recorded. And then there's a gap of, of 18 years, and then there's another event, a series of events recorded. And people don't contemplate very much what happened in those gapped years what 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 were the events of jesus life in the times in between and and what i'm demonstrating to people now is what i'm doing now is what happened in between <laughs> the, this is the process of of becoming at one with god this is what it involved for me in the first century and this is what it's going to involve for anybody who wishes to become at one with god and 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 i can remember the gaps in between if anybody's interested in here but what do you have to verify it with nothing and so, so in the end of the day, you can ask me questions about my life and in particular questions about my life in all of those gapped years. Mm. But what proof do you have that even what I'm saying about that is even true? There's none really. Mm. And until such a time as the so-called physical evidence or the miraculous evidence appears, which only appeared in the first century after I became one with God, until such a time there's probably going to be lots of disbelief about my claim. Mm. And, and and I can't see I, whether yeah. that, uh, how that cannot be the case. Yeah, yeah. And, and if I could add to that, I don't want to take over your interview, Jeff, but no, no. <laughs> um, I feel that uh, for myself personally, and I think for AJ also, we really have absolutely no expectation that people believe us on mm. these claims. And no, you don't uh, seem to care. Not at all. Mm. And in fact, most, I would say, the majority of people in our life really haven't resolved the issue for themselves. Definitely haven't. Um, yeah. And, um, yeah, it's not a... It's not a much as, the media portrayed... I think uh, somebody counted the amount of times were shown AJ writing on the board, I'm Jesus, deal with it, mm. and uh, which was shown quite out of context. Mm. And out of context, it does seem like the main thrust of what we're saying is I'm Jesus and I'm here and you've got to deal with it, mm. which is actually not the truth. And which was a culmination of three years of presentations, 52 presentations a year. So after nearly 200 presentations, um, people were still coming up and asking me the identical questions they were asking me three years earlier about mm. the Jesus issue. Yeah. And I'm just saying, well, look, I'm saying I'm Jesus, you've got to have to deal with that sooner or later. <laughs> and yeah. let's get on to some other subject that matters. You know? yeah. All right, well, let's get on to another subject that <laughs> sure, matters. Sure. <laughs> um, you talk a lot about emotional clearing, as this is part of the divine path you have to deal with your emotions. Is, is that true? You, you spend a lot of time getting people to get, into, get in touch with their emotions and and you say that this is how you, this is how they will hit, come to good health, and and this is also how they will learn what it is to be loving in the divine sense. Can I? Yeah. Did, yeah. Is I'll that something that you I'm did sure in first add. century? Because there's there's you know not uh, there's record. not a lot of record yeah. of you doing that. Is this a new angle or uh, <laughs> <is> it... <laughs> new and improved? Uh, um, I, uh, I'll dispute I you about the first century yeah. for a start, well, but, but, okay. but we can talk about that after Mary's yeah. answered. I feel yeah. the process of becoming at one with God is the same now as it was then. Mm. And um, I know that there's a lot of um, language, I suppose, surrounding us about emotional processing, clearing emotions, the different emotions, fear, anger, grief. And um, while... I feel that's a really valuable aspect of what we're teaching. For me, it's about a connection to our soul and a recognition that unless I connect with my soul, I can't connect with the creator of my soul. And my soul is inherently emotional. It's, it's an emotional construct that God created. And um, unfortunately, on the planet, there are a lot of emotions within 
accept every soul that are out of harmony with love. But in my day-to-day -day life, I don't really have a, pro a, a focus on emotional processing. I have a focus on creating a connection with my Father, God, and, and in that process, I become emotional. <laughs> and I ask God to uh, remove from me the emotions which are in error and in disharmony with love. Now, in the first century, that happened, but perhaps the language in which it's described, and even in the pageant messages, is a little different to the language that we use now. But it is essentially the same process. For one, to if you think about um, emotions like greed and pride and jealousy, they're all things mentioned commonly in the Bible. I think, although I'm not au fait with the Bible as much as perhaps you both are. Um, the, the true way to eradicate those things from our soul is an emotional way. So it can be done, if you like, from an intellectual sense, but the injury still exists within, within our soul. So um, that process, which I was a part of in the first century, of eradicating those things from my soul was very emotional. But I didn't call it emotional processing at the time, you know. Um, it was more of a natural feeling. It, it's time. a natural feeling. And honestly, the more that I connect to this longing for God, the process becomes emotional. And I'm sure many Christians have, and other people have who desire to connect to God of all religious and non-religious uh, classical well, traditional religious groupings would say it's a very emotional experience when one desires to connect with God and I think that the reason we talk about emotions so commonly is that and and we use perhaps different language, is that we're trying to present it in a way that people can use and understand for myself, I feel in terms of the way that I've been teaching about that is changing as I change and understand and remember my relationship with God in a lot more clarity. So uh, in the past, I was quite focused on emotions and with with because I was shut down to this longing to God that now I feel pulls me through emotions and into a lot of joy quite rapidly. Yeah, I, I sort of go a bit further than Mary on the issue. I feel that um, I feel one of the major impediments that mankind has today is the amount of effort we've spent shutting down the true condition of our heart. So, in other words, most people on their in their day to day life falsify their true feelings and their true thoughts quite frequently, mm. and. And we need to somehow help people to stop doing that so that they become more truthful and more open and more honest about what they're really feeling and what they're really thinking. And to do that, we need to help them understand what's a true emotion and what's a fabricated emotion. Mm. And what I mean by that is that um, emotions like anger, for example, are fabrications of a de the denial of a deeper emotion. And usually, and it's well known now in psychological circles, that if a person's angry, they're usually quite afraid of something. And in their denial of their fear, they, they use anger as a method of controlling their fear-based response. And so there does need to be, to a degree, an understanding about emotions before a person can really understand what it means to be childlike in the manner in which they express their truth. In other words, the, the way they speak the truth and feel it. And, and I feel one of the primary impediments on the planet is that people don't know how to do that because we've been so far removed from it. And in removing ourselves from that, we've removed ourselves from the way in which we connect with God. And so for that reason, we've had to spend a bit of time, uh, uh, you know, quite a few years of my time has been spent up to this point trying to help people work through the fact that when they're angry, they're actually denying something, for example. Mm. And when they're afraid, they're shutting down other emotions that they actually have. When they're afraid, they're shutting down desires that they actually feel. In other words, they, they're not doing the things they really want to do because they're afraid and they need to deal with their fears and start working through their fears. If they want to live in their desire. If they want to be, yeah, yeah live in a, a passionate life. And once they can at least start to understand that, then they can understand how God is involved in the process. They can begin to understand how to connect to God and ask for God's help to deal with these particular emotions. 
Now in the first century I used to talk about that quite frequently. I talked about the emotions of individuals and the way that I confronted them mostly was by suggesting, suggesting to them different actions that would confront those emotions. So if, if a man was rich and he was very afraid to give up his riches, I would suggest to him that he sells everything he has and gives it to the poor. But if a man was poor, then I would make a different suggestion to him to confront different emotions. If a person had a family, then I would make a whole different set of uh, emotions, uh, uh, conditions to deal with their emotions. And everything I suggested to them was about trying to confront their emotional condition. When you look at the Paget messages, I often refer in the Paget messages in my own writings to Paget, uh, to passion, desire, longing, and those kind of emotions, the importance of having a development of passion and soul-based longing inside of yourself to follow a certain course of action, in, in this case towards God. And so we were often focusing on trying to help the person become more passionate, more loving, more, you know, more longing in their soul, more, more desire. And, uh, and this is what we're trying to do now. And the things that shut down desire and passion is primarily fear and grief. And our, our fear of our grief often is what prevents us from living a passionate life in the future. We've, we've had negative things happen in the past and that causes us then to be shut down to becoming open and passionate, desirous in our future. And so those emotions do need to be addressed if a person's ever going to become, at close, going to become close to God. Okay, now the character of God as, as you uh, describe it, um, a lot of uh, New Age people who are often recovering Christians and recovering Catholics and who have moved into, a, I guess, an understanding of God that's a bit larger mm -hmm. than the biblical one, uh, they see God as natural law and uh, God as the universe and maybe there is something within them that is what they might refer to as a divine spark mm -hmm. that is going to mature towards this universal power somehow but you refer to God as a being mm -hmm. which is very different mm -hmm. and you refer to God as the creator mm -hmm. and that he is a being that we can actually have a relationship with mm -hmm. and I think a lot of people have um, sort of removed that possibility mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. after seeing many people through, throughout thousands of years ask this being for things that weren't forthcoming <laughs> yep. Yep. Uh, and they also look around them and they see much beauty in the in the world and they say yep there's God but they also look around and they see much cruelty and a lot of suffering mm -hmm. um, a four-year-old with cancer for example mm -hmm. yeah. um, animals getting eaten alive and, mm -hmm. you know by parasites and they think well what sort of is this a is this a god place or not? Mm. Yeah. Mm. And so, a, a lot of people say, "Well, I'm having difficulty believing in God as a being who created this, when it's not a pretty picture down here." Yeah. yeah. Jeff, just your is camera is just. The camera. Uh, is it flashing? Be, uh, long insight, and it's three minutes left. Of three the minutes left of the tape. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have another tape? Yeah, yeah I. Yeah. Yeah. Because we can just, answer. Yeah, I'll just stop it there. If you're yeah. happy to keep going, yeah. I yeah. said half an hour, and you've been going for an hour. No, that's fine. All right, okay. now yeah. you tape. Now we were answering the question of um, God being a personal being, as yeah, people the, having the, a lot of a lot of trouble coming to terms with that these the, days. The question you've asked is what I would believe to be the fundamental question that every person in the universe needs to ask. The reason why I believe it's the fundamental question is that if if God is not a personal being that we can connect to, then it's pointless talking about having a relationship with God. It, what's left is a relationship with people or with other, uh, with other creation, or if you could call it that, or other things that have evolved. Obviously, if there's, no, if there's no creator, then there's got to be a process of creation or involvement that has occurred. So, it, to, so to me, it is a fundamental question. The, another reason why it's a fundamental question is because one of the things I discovered in the first century is that most people had a very, very limited viewpoint of God, if a viewpoint at all. 
And this is why I feel the majority of people are what you would classify as being agnostic. In other words, they are very unsettled and uncertain about the existence of God in either direction. And so they finish up giving up on the issue of to whether God exists and focusing more and more on their personal lives and getting happiness in their personal life rather than connecting with God. Is this a fault of the design? You know, like if... Uh, no, I don't believe like, so. Like an atheist might say that if, if we are all supposed to be following a divine path, why isn't that path laid out? Well, it a is. little bit more well, clearly. Yeah. It is. I feel it is. <laughs> and y you feel it is. <laughs> yeah. 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 But, but they I don't. Un but I do under... Sorry. Sorry. Do you you, want you go for it, Mary. No, you, go, you answer the question. <laughs> you answer it. Because you're going to get I'm involved. I'm passionate in, about yeah. it as well. Yeah, so when you're finished, I'll, if, <laughs> I'll say a couple of things. <laughs> well, the, the issue you face, if I can answer it logically first, is the, the issue we face is this. We are perceiving God based on error. We, we are coming from our error-based condition and trying to examine God. That's what mankind is currently doing. And because of that, what we're doing is we're analysing our environment and we're going, if this is what all what God created, then, it, then we can then suppose that this God isn't a very nice God or God is not interested in us all or God doesn't exist at all. However, that presupposes that what we have currently to examine is actually not being modified by humans themselves and their own condition. And I put to you that actually, through the process of physics, it's now been proven that the observer definitely modifies mm. the results with regard to anything. And this is the problem we face on Earth. If we continue to examine God from the point of view of where we are, we are going to continually have a problem with our logic because our logic is going to be dependent upon examining God from this perspective, which is only one perspective. It's like looking at the sun from the earth and saying, well, the sun's that big. <laughs> when we could go to the sun and, and we find that it's actually huge, huge, far bigger than, than, than millions of us put together. Well, I guess that compounds the problem a bit because, you know, you, you, we're looking at documentaries where... For 40 million years, all there were were trilobites. And we think, well, what was God doing then? How was he entertained by getting these <laughs> trilobites animated? <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, and there's, then there's this supposition too that, uh, that, that uh, if God does exist, then why has God allowed these millions of years to pass for, for different things to be developed, for things to follow a seemingly evolutionary pattern? Um, that that scientists to a degree agree on upon and and so what we finish up with is we finish up with this concept that we are going to judge God through one of a few different means firstly we judge God by what's happening on earth secondly we judge God by religion's definition of God and thirdly we judge God by our own scientific achievements in, in other words, the understand, our own scientific understanding in the day. Now, now all of those, coming from those three perspectives is flawed in logic in every single case. If we look at coming from the perspective of, the, of God through science, we are basically saying that a person who, if there is a God, created our body, we can't even understand our own body at this point or how it works. We have no understanding, really, about our body and how it works phys physiologically. We don't understand genetics still. We don't understand so many things about the brain. In fact, the brain is like a great big unknown when it comes to medical science. And, and yet what we're saying is this body and this brain is capable of, of, of judging the God that created it. Now, that, to me, makes no logical sense. Um, if we come at God from the position of current religion, if we look at religion, in every single case, religion has been created by the emotions of mankind generally to dominate other men and women. So it, it comes from a flawed concept immediate, uh, and, and then it creates a, or constructs a God that is violent, angry, abusive, often genocidal, um, and it constructs a God and then imposes that God upon itself the religion that it that constructed it and and coming from that perspective i put is flawed because even the most loving person in that religion is better than the god that they're worshiping in most cases 
And so, so when we examine God from this perspective of science or we examine God from the perspective of religion, and what was the first one that I mentioned? I can't remember now. The, uh, the perspective of um, location. And every single time, what we're doing is we are coming from a limited perspective, trying to examine a God that, if, if exists, created all of these things and therefore would have a far better perspective of what, of what is actually going on. And then we start to judge it through human suffering. And so what we do is we look at the suffering on the planet and we look at the suffering as humans are, humans are by nature quite arrogant because what we do is we own every achievement that seems to be positive but everything that seems to be negative we blame on somebody else. So what we do is we look at the earth and we go, oh, these negative things have happened on earth, this parasite ate this dog and this, you know, these kind of things are all happening. So that proves to me that God created a terrible system or, or there is no God. When in reality, it doesn't place into, into the, the pot the one major condition, and that is mankind heavily modifies its own environment and then measures God by that environment that it's modified. And that in itself is a flawed position. Mm. So what I realised in the first century was that the way mankind was examining or attempting to examine God was very flawed in almost every case. And so what I did is I took a different perspective. The perspective I took then was this. I said that if there was a God, because all we're trying to do is prove whether there is a personal God or not. That's, mm. that's the basic underlying thing. We need to have a way of proving it. And what I was suggesting, what I suggested to myself was, if there is a God who is a personal God, it would make logical sense that that personal God would give her creation, her children, a way to connect to her, to prove, to see whether there was this God or not, and, whether, and what God's nature was. And it would make sense that that God also showed us the roadmap by showing a relationship between a parent and a child. It would make sense to me that that relationship... So in that relationship, can God intervene in our circumstances? Because we don't see much evidence of... We see a lot of people praying for intervention, but we don't see a lot of well, the evidence the, of intervention. Well, we can get to that question separately, because that's a separate... It is a separate question. Okay. The, the, se the question of intervention is all about who defines what is loving intervention. Now, mankind think, again, in their arrogance, that they should be able to define what is loving intervention. But if you look at ma most of mankind's actions, what we often do is we create a whole series of negative events and then we expect somebody else to come along and fix them for us. And when that somebody else does come along and fix them for us, we then go ahead and create a whole n new series of unloving events, <laughs> generally, and then we want somebody else to come along and fix those for us as well. And so this is the problem again of examining it from the point of view of the intervention. Why would God intervene with something that mankind actually created for themselves? It would make more sense for a loving person to say, no, you created this event, you need to learn how to resolve it. You need to learn how to become more loving to resolve the issue. And that is a loving provision, I feel, that any parent would have for their child. Like, a loving parent would desire for their child to learn how to take responsibility for themselves, for their own soul, so that they may navigate through life in a loving and a way that serves them and others well. And I feel that God is the ultimate parent. Like, God is showing us and attempting to lovingly teach us at every moment how we can grow and take responsibility and in that process grow towards him. Can I and give an illustration perhaps that sure. sort of suits the, the, the situation? Most parents give children gifts. Now, we might give a child a gift of, let's say we give it a gift of a little matchbox car or something like that. Now, if that child went out, grabbed the matchbox car, went out on the ground, put it on the ground, got out a baseball bat and bang, bang, bang and bashed it into pieces and then come back to, to the parent crying and saying, I want another matchbox car. The parent would probably very seriously consider whether it should give it a second matchbox car under those circumstances. And because the parent would be going, well, hang on a sec, you just went out and smashed up the matchbox car that I just gave you as a gift. How about you first sort out why you did that before I give you another one. At least most parents would probably want to do that. And we, humankind, has become like that child. 
we have become like a child who has received a whole series of gifts, right? And then in the process of receiving those series of gifts, have bashed them into smithereens and then went back to our parent pleading for it to get more when the reality is that, that the parents got to say, well, no, hang on a sec, let's work through the issue first of why you decided to smash everything up first and then we'll look at giving you some more. It's certainly not the case that you're never having any matchbox cars in, in punishment. It's, it's, it's the principle that in order to appreciate and really enjoy the matchbox car, you have to love it. Mm. Um, and you and have we need to... to learn how to love, you see. So, so, so what we need to do is we need to start coming to terms with the fact that we are often being unloving and then blaming other people for our actions. And in particular, we're, we're adept at blaming God. And so what we finish up doing is we go, God's this or God's that or God's done this or God's done that, when the reality is that humankind have a, made a lot of unloving choices and as a result of making a lot of unloving choices have finished up becoming these people who then want somebody else to sort all of their unloving choices out. And, and God is always waiting for us to sort ourselves out and gives us lots and lots of help in doing so as long as we are willing to go through that process of sorting things out. I'm sorry, I just... Uh, a We've got a few visitors. I think Igor's. Yeah, we're, we're, we'll just proceed here yeah. because I want to proceed. <laughs> um, none of the others have arranged anything with me, so that's fine. Um, so, so what we need to do is separate the question of, as to God's existence from what's actually happening on the earth because what's happening on the earth is the direct result of mankind's desire to act out of harmony with love. And with each other yeah. and with the environment. Yeah. So let's separate the two. So let's now look at whether God exists or not. Now, the, there is a simple test, and the simple test is this. If I have a longing to receive God's love, and my longing to receive God's love is pure, in other words, it's not tainted by addiction or demand or anger or rage or fear neediness. or neediness, but it's actually a pure desire, and if I have this pure desire for God's love, then what will happen is I will receive it. And in the moment of receiving it, I will be able to prove God's existence or not as an individual being or not. If I then go, allow to go through my mind, God is not an individual being but a nebulous force, and then see whether I still feel the same emotion or not from God, then I'll know whether God is a nebulous force or an individual being or not. It'll be just a simple matter of connecting to God in each case. Perhaps we just need to pause. See this. So yeah. you're not married? No. 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 Not, you, not yet. Well, we depends. might get married. You might? Yeah. You, you believe in marriage? Yeah. marriage right? Well, it um, depends how you view it because it, we were married once before. Exactly. <laughs> like, we're not. <laughs> and we both have the viewpoint that marriage is a condition in your heart. Yeah. Um, and I've said to Mary that I don't know whether we will get married until we start confronting all of these religious viewpoints of <laughs> of, of marriage. marriage. <laughs> yeah. 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 What about gay marriage? Do you believe in gay marriage? Certainly. Certainly? Yeah. The, well, it's the same concept, you know. It's, yeah. yeah. I feel that it's a condition in a person's heart. Yeah. Yeah. Are you are you you're married? Yeah. 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 Second marriage. Yeah, those ones are not very good. And does your wife share your passion of, of about God or charts, matters relating to God? Oh, no, not really. No. 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 But we think fairly similarly. Similarly, yeah. 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 But it's so. just a particular kind of interest. Well, I had, I had a more of an environment where I grew up in a church background. Yeah. Um, so sort of like the difference between you and AJ. Yeah. You know, AJ's yeah. got that that well, biblical he's, he's knowledge. He's got the biblical knowledge. Because of his background. But I would and, but we share the passion, obviously. But you still have the same passion. God. Mm. Um, well, I suppose there's another thing, and, and that is in the spirit world, you were never really uh, involved very much in the biblical side of things. Like Whereas no. I, <laughs> I was often like Luke, more yeah. fascinated in like how how it come about, about the modifications the and, and all of those things. Yeah, so I've often took more of an interest in it. Yeah.
So do you think some people get a head start on on their understanding? Like, like you you had a, a realization when you were say eighteen. You said when in the first century, you knew you were different. What gave you that head start? What what gave you that difference? Like when I was fourteen, for some reason, I decided to recite Desiderata. <laughs> Now I have no idea why a fourteen-year-old would want would be interested in Desiderata, which is a philosophical mm. words of wisdom that was actually written in the nineteen twenties, mm. not the sixteen nineties, as written on the paper. Mm. Now, you know, I was different. What makes people different? Well, uh, from from well, God's given us all a unique personality that is all a part of the appropriate way of. Um, the, the way that God wants the universe to operate it is that each of us fully engage our uniqueness and in fully u engaging our uniqueness each of us will have a part to play in the universe that is unique so, so the way God designed the universe was in such a way that each of us would be fully involved by actually embracing our unique individual passion and then following that passion with, with a passion and so has this design worked? Yeah, certainly. Okay. Um, so there is no design fault. No, no. When, and, and it's interesting, the more developed in love you become, the more you realise there is no design fault. Um, it's, it's only when we are operating out of harmony with the laws of love and the principles of truth that we are butting our heads against the brick wall of God's laws. And in butting our head against the brick wall of God's laws, we get bleeding sores <laughs> on ourselves, which is the result of our own, which is the result of our own. But surely, an, an, a, an almighty, foreseeing, omnipotent being would have known that that was going to happen. Of course, that's why she created such a universe that that we would have feedback through the process of of yeah. suffering. So I think a lot of people see they, they they hear religious people talk about what God intended. And and they think, well, well, wait a minute. That very phrase implies a mistake was made. <laughs> That's does. exactly right. It, it and, does. Yeah. And the reality is that I don't believe that anything that is currently happening is not what that that God did not foresee it, because that all of God's laws are are completely. Uh, not only beautiful in their operation, but are, are completely without fault if you examine them carefully. And in, in the beauty of the law, there is always a correction. And we are, as humanity, we are going through this process of correction. Now, anybody who goes through a process of correction is going to have emotional challenges because they are going to want to hold on to their error inside of themselves. And, and, and so the universe at large... Is, is wanting them to have the cor corrected viewpoint. And so what's going to happen is there's going to be discrepancy between their emotional condition and, or their error and the correct viewpoint that's universal. And what we're doing as, uh, as a human race is we're often butting our heads against the correct viewpoint because we want to retain our error. We want to retain the false position or the position that's unloving and hope that God somehow comes to our unloving you know unloving position and of course that's never going to happen and so with god we're butting ourselves up against a brick wall basically now when i say a brick wall i'm saying that all of god's laws are immovable because they're all perfect and they don't need to be moved and so what we need to do is come to see how we're out of harmony with those laws and once we get into harmony with those laws what we find is it sort of supercharges our life because now we're bringing things into harmony with God's laws. All of God's laws are now working with us in our accomplishments rather than working to correct us from our wayward path. And, and in the first century, I gave many illustrations of this, you know, even the, the whole illustration of the prodigal son is all about the prodigal son coming up against the loving laws of God and, and then realising down the track that he had... had transgressed against those laws and and then changed himself to a point where he now didn't want to do that anymore he wanted to act more lovingly and this is the problem the whole of humanity faces really is to is are we going to continually butt ourselves up against the brick wall of of these laws 
and, and then say God's at fault because I'm in pain because I've just headbutted these laws? Or are we going to say, well, I've got pain and a loving God's not going to create pain for me unless I, I'm in error somewhere that, that I'm, I'm actually I'm creating, I'm creating it by butting my head against the wall. It's a bit like us going up to a wall, butting our head against the wall and then complaining that the builder put the wall there. And that's what we do all the time with God. We, we go up to the wall, butt our head against the wall. When it's bleeding, we say, oh, I'm suffering and I'm in pain. Why did you put the wall there? And, and, yeah. and we don't trust that actually God is a loving God and put every wall that is constructed in the universe is constructed for a loving reason. And we don't trust that. It's, it's like you referred to earlier about arrogance. The, the, it's the major issue of humanity at the time is saying, I know what, at this time I feel, is saying, I know what is loving and therefore the wall is in error. <laughs> it takes a lot of humility, I feel, to acknowledge that there is a loving God who knows more uh, about love than I do. And so if I'm against a wall, perhaps the humble thing is to look at myself and not the wall. And mm. Um, mm. I feel that that with more humility, people would find the path to God much more intuitive and natural. Um, mm. But it's this strong self-reliance that is so instilled in so many of us that means that we don't even want to see that there's a wall. Yeah. By the time we get to be an adult, um, unfortunately what's happened to the majority of us is we've lost a lot of the traits of a child. A lot of the traits of a child are to trust something until it's proven untrustworthy. As an adult, we don't trust anything until it's proven trustworthy. So we, we take almost entirely the opposite tack as an adult than we would as a child. Even as an adult, we see trust as a sign of weakness, don't we? Rather exactly. than saying, no, I can discern things, I can trust, and then I can decide not to trust. Mm. We, we feel that somehow... There's so and, much fear in it. Yeah, and often that is because emotionally we've been invested in trusting something rather than trusting something from a space of um, non-investment, if you like. Yeah. So what, what we're often doing is that we ha have, as an adult, we've reversed a lot of these childlike traits that would assist us in, in coming to terms very rapidly as to whether there is a God, whether that God is a personal being or not, whether the God is just an energy source, and all of those questions would be very rapidly answered with some very simple tests. But unfortunately, as adults, what we try to do is complicate our testing process because we think we're more intelligent than that and we believe it should be harder than it actually is. Whereas um, if, we, if we just thought as a child would think, a child would go, well, you know, and any child that's quite young would go, well, my mummy and daddy, they don't automatically assume mummy and daddy doesn't love them. They automatically assume mummy and daddy love them. So why would not I automatically assume that God loves me rather than coming from a perspective that God doesn't love me and then taking that as the primary assumption? And, and what, so what I'm trying to get at is that we are often assuming things about God that prevent us from determining the truth about God. And then we're, we're using those assumptions as facts because we no longer have a connection with the God that's impossible to have while we're making those assumptions. And, and, and this is where we're, we're doing all things back to front. If we allow ourselves... The, the possibility that God is a, a being that connects, that ha, is our creator, like our mother or our father, that could connect to us in love, then it becomes a simple question, well, if I'm not receiving that love or I don't feel loved by that God, then perhaps there's something going on inside of me that's present, preventing that love from flowing rather than something inside of God. For, for most of us, what we do is we blame God for not loving us when the reality is actually more along the lines that we need to look at ourselves as to why we're not feeling loved. Uh, because the, the logical thing is that if there is a God that is our creator, then that God would surely love us if the God was loving enough to create a beautiful body for us, a body that's focused on our receiving pleasure. You look at even the process of eating, drinking, sexual behavior, all of these different things. The body itself that that God has created is all focused on trying to assist us to enjoy our life more passionately and have more joy in, and, and, and uh, enjoyment of our life. And then to assume that that God mustn't be interested in our joy 
is, is like almost two totally opposite assumptions. Mm -hmm. and, and this is where I feel mankind makes the basic primary mistake. In the first century, this is the reason I, well, I feel why I was the first person to enter that condition, is because instead of trying to get all of this intellectual philosophy about God, I just started from a child's perspective of its parent and just assumed that if I didn't, if I wasn't in this state where I feel, felt loved, then it had to do with something that I believed rather than something that God was. And, and I found through that process of that, just that simple one assumption, that not only did I have proven to me through that process God's existence, but I had proven to me what God's laws were. And, and, and I finished up receiving knowledge from that God of all of these different things that the average person around me didn't receive because they didn't have the same basic childlike assumption right at the beginning, which was that there is a God that loves me and is willing to tell me everything I want to know. Yeah. yeah. So as as your character achieved at one moment, you discovered that killing was wrong. Would you say? Oh, uh, way before then. Way before you don't believe in killing. Yeah. No, I, I discovered when I was eighteen or nineteen that killing. Well, way, way before what then. What about animals? Uh, animals the same. When I was when I was uh, thirteen years of age, my father in the first century took me to the temple, and there was blood from the animals squealing and carrying on with the slaughter from so-called sacrifices to God, there was blood running down the sides of the streets from these animals that stunk to high heaven and also had I could just feel the fear of the animals and immediately I became a, a vegetarian in the first century from that one thing because it just felt so unloving. I was totally disgusted with the whole operation of the temple at the time. So, so total non-violence to people and animals. Yes. And that includes emotional violence. Emotional it? violence, if, if yeah. you understand mm. what I mean by so that. So in other words, yeah. there's no need for me to be angry with you. If I'm angry with you, there's something I need to address within me, no matter what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And non-materialistic. Um, no, we live in a materialist, we, we live in a material world, so I wouldn't call it us non-materialistic. I would but, say more along the lines of um, we're more concerned about living in harmony with love with the material world. So, in other words, we recognise the need of a material world for a material person to live in. Uh, we also recognise there is a spiritual world and soul-based worlds as well. And, and for us, we live in all of them concurrently. We've, we talk to all of them concurrently and so forth. But, but living in the material world is a necessity for material people. But it needs to be done in a loving and, and, and harmonious manner. It can't be done in a way that destroys the environment and is non-sustainable. You're, you're obviously not desiring wealth. No. That, no. That's not one of your desires. A lot of people say, oh, this guy's trying to ma manipulate people so he can get donations from all over the world and he can fester his nest, but it uh, <laughs> doesn't look apparent that you've... <laughs> no. Uh, you know, I'm perfectly happy to receive an, millions of dollars worth of donations, but I'll probably spend them on furthering the... The, the these, information, this giving information. the information. <laughs> so, That's, I would say, 80% of uh, what we receive, would you say? More than that, more probably. Than that. Goes into creating free DVDs, travelling us to seminars... Um, and we clothe ourselves and we feed ourselves vegan food in the process. Yeah, yeah. But we don't live You made a comment that you were tearing down your fences too, which I found interesting because in one of the... In John Lennon's Imagine, uh, I think he summed up three things that would help with world peace. And one was you no know, borders, and uh, which is something that I think a lot of people would agree. Yeah, yeah. I believe yeah. strongly in no borders from a country perspective or an individual perspective. So, you know, one of the reasons why we're taking down the fences is we don't see any need to protect the our location, but also we see fences as a way of control and we don't believe control is a very good way of developing love. Mm. And you're also critical of religion because it does the same thing, really, as borders. Yep. Yeah. In, in your opinion, it, uh, it is set up for control reasons. Yes, I, I, I'm perfectly happy to see uh, like thousands of religions as long as those religions practice natural love with each other 
In other words, they don't fight and bicker and, and blame each other and, and, and almost, well, many in historically have murdered each other just because they had different belief systems. Now, that's obviously out of harmony with love. So, so I'm perfectly happy for a whole a, set, a religion to have its own desires and way of life as long as those desires and way of, of life are actually in harmony with truth. So um, you're, you're probably a little bit disappointed with the, uh, the religion that was created uh, in your name. <laughs> I don't know if you could say I'm disappointed because um, I never created the religion for a start. So there were people who came a long time after my life on earth who decided to create the religion. They had their own agendas at work. I, am, I wasn't surprised because with anything that's happened on the earth, it's usually gotten highly distorted through the amalgamation of religion and politics on the planet. So where has it so, got it right? Where has Christianity got it right? Well, when it talks about grace, the grace of God, and when it talks about uh, being loving to all persons on the planet, it's definitely got it right. When it talks about, uh, you know, uh, separation and and condemning certain people of certain race or certain sexuality or certain gender or all of this, then it's definitely got it wrong. And I feel it's got it wrong around the area of sacrifice meaning love and love meaning sacrifice, Yeah, which is a pretty core tenant as far as I understand from the outside. I've never been... Well, it's the first quote that you get from the... Uh proselytizing Christian is that <laughs> Jesus died for your sins. Yeah. Yes. And, and that's and not that's the truth. Not the that's truth. not the truth. No. Yeah. And and it can never be the truth because it's not fair and everything God does is fair. So it's not fair for a person who's never who's been without sin or who proposed purportedly been without sin I should say. Um it's not fair for such a person to pay the penalties of all the sinners. It's, it's like if you had three children of your own and two of the children were unruly radicals who, who basically were quite violent and the third child was peace-loving and kind and considerate and compassionate, you wouldn't grab that compassionate, considerate third child and punish it for the deeds of the other two. And yet Christians are saying that that's exactly what God's doing. And it doesn't make any logical sense because it, because it actually puts the average person on earth in a better condition of love than God is, if you believe what the Christians are saying. And so then yeah. it's these doctrines and these creeds that people have sworn allegiance to that are holding them in that place. Yes, but, but it's very important to understand that any doctrine or creed has only been created to support a certain emotional position. So, so for example, you would not be able to accept a belief inside of you unless there was some predisposition emotionally for you to accept such a belief. Now, if I can illustrate that, if, if you believe that somehow a person who loves you also punishes you, then you will be open to a belief that God can love you and punish you at the same time. But if you didn't believe that a person who attempts to punish you loves you, then you wouldn't be able to accept that there would be a God who punishes you and loves you at the same time. It's just our emotional openness to certain belief systems that create and perpetrate those belief systems that are out of harmony with love. And what we need to do, and this is why it's important to talk about emotions, because what we need to do is we, look at, we need to look instead of, instead of going, I want God to be a wrathful God, we need to say, well, what is God really? Is God a wrathful God? Because logically, it makes sense to me. If if God was a wrathful God, we'd all be dead. Like because sooner or later, all of us have probably annoyed God at some point, right? And we'd all be dead. Um, and if God was a wrathful God, it doesn't make much sense to me. Um, but, but but we need to say that rather than rather than going, I want God to be a wrathful God because I want God to punish all those people that I'm not allowed to punish. <laughs> Um, and and we need to stop imposing our own unhealed condition upon God and also imposing our unhealed condition upon other people on the planet. We need to start owning it that, wow, yeah, I've got a really unloving emotion inside of me, which is I want other people to be punished for what they've done towards me, and I need to heal that within me and stop that. I need to stop the concept. So what is, the, for what is the best way for people to heal that emotion? Once they discover that they have this emotion... Mm -hmm that uh, whether it was instilled by their parents or whether it was from a trauma as a child, how do they go about getting rid of that emotion? Well, the simplest way is to firstly talk to God about the truth of it 
In other words... What if they don't even know the truth of it? What if they were so young that they're not able to process the truth of it? No, no, I'm not talking about the truth of the emotion in the way that you're thinking. I'm saying the truth of acknowledging that what they really feel right now. Okay. So, so, for example, if I really, really feel angry with Jeff right now, instead of me trying to make out that I'm not angry with Jeff, I need to own, I am angry with Jeff. That's going to help me get one step further into getting closer to the motion. And then I can ask myself, well, why am I angry with Jeff? I've only just met the man. What's going on? You know, like, like what, what, what inside of me or what inside of him rubs me up the wrong way to cause me to feel this anger? And I am angry anyway. That's not his problem. That's my problem. So I need to look at what's going on inside of me that would cause me. So I need to have some degree of self-analysis, some degree of honest appraisement of my own condition before I'll be willing to honestly examine anything further. Once I can do that, I can start actually longing to God to show me what the error is. And whenever I've done that in my own life, and Mary's had the same experience all through her 2,000 years of life too, whenever you, we've done that of just longing to God to show us, within a few moments generally we're shown what the problem is. And usually it's a problem that comes from our own unhealed emotional state somewhere in our past or a belief system that's in us that is out of harmony. So you don't have this perfect harmonious relationship where you're forgiving all the time and uh, so you have quarrels and uh, you have arguments um, and uh, or are you... Are you well, we come from the you're premise... Things well, once we, we became at one with God after the first century in the spirit world, then we never had any arguments anymore. So we've had, like, if you look at our life of 2,000 years... Probably 1,900 years of it's been argument-free. Right? <laughs> but but in the first century, before uh, when certainly. I met Mary, we certainly um, had disagreements, um, and and we had disagreements up to my time of passing. Um, I I didn't have any anger in them, but Mary sometimes did yeah. at the time, because again I had a head start on Mary in the first century in terms of working my way through my own things. I met Mary when I was in my 30s in the first century whereas I'd been working on my own condition since I was 18 in the first century or even earlier than that, actually. Um, so so I'd had the chance to sort out a lot of myself um, okay. uh, in yeah. that time, and Mary hadn't. Yeah. And in this life, it's very similar. So so I feel more forgiving, perhaps, than uh, than Mary does at this point in time. Um, but, but that being, we're basically both work in progress, so there are times when we disagree with each other. So you were you actually said that in uh, in one thing that I was watching that Mary's death and her situation uh, of uh, on the earth was far more severe than your death. Yes. And yes. Uh, I only so she... took a few hours to die, about six hours to die, whereas Mary Mary took many days to die and was Three. tortured in that time. Three or four. Yeah. yeah. Three or four. Yeah. Yeah. And you have a memory of that now. Yep. Yeah, I do. That must be a fairly painful memory. <laughs> it is, and it's um, well, it's probably something that started when I was fifteen, and I found too perplexing, and so I filed it. And now, um, yeah, now I'm more open to that emotional experience. It's quite, it's been terrifying, traumatic, shocking, and um, uh, shameful. All kinds of emotions that come with it. Yeah. Uh, as with all um, our allowance of emotion, however, it um, because I still am afraid of that process, I often um, allow it for a few days and then I shut down in my fear. Because, as you would possibly uh, understand, it's quite psychologically um, confusing as well. And um, certainly this issue of resolving identity is something that AJ has been through a, a long process really haven't you babe of years uh, to come to a point where he can just speak op openly clearly freely about n any aspect of it and mm. for myself I often um, have difficulty difficulty expressing it it feels very personal a lot of the emotions that I'm experiencing and um and there's still the psychological struggle that I'm going through. And um, it's not just an issue around the memories. 
it's also, I guess that's what I wanted to say earlier when you were speaking to AJ about how he knows. Um, for myself, I feel like I've reached a place of knowing, but I still rebel against that at times. And it's not just that I know because of because I remember everything. Because at this stage, I don't remember everything. I remember fair portions of a lot of things. But because I'm still in this process of opening myself emotionally, uh, I don't remember everything. But there is also the, the issue of... Um, but you have no doubt whatsoever about, about where that I memory am. comes from. Hmm. No, no, no. And especially when I'm allowing the allowing the memory mm. uh if you like I, and that's what i wanted to say earlier is you'd that prefer to have some doubt wouldn't you <laughs> yes and we were speaking earlier about emotional investment in beliefs and i've searched myself high and wide and low to find my uh, an what would be an emotional investment in this belief because yeah. honestly and i can't find one um but i feel that our certainty in life in in any knowledge comes when we're willing to expose and allow whatever emotion is associated with whatever we're being presented with, I don't know if you agree with that. Um, it's not a. It's, I've never really verbalised that before, but um, and so, like when these emotions first started happening for me, I didn't take that as proof that this was true. Mm -hmm. um, and it certainly wasn't a sudden download, yes, I know this to be truth. It's been a long process for me um, and at times a struggle um, to, to allow what is so overwhelmingly real for me um, and then to come out the other end of it and realise what that means. <laughs> and also I have felt that I need to, to go through a process of discerning what is actually happening. Like, is this a spirit communication that's happening for me? Or is there some other childhood event that I'm somehow now attaching to this emotional experience? And and I resolved some time ago that it, it wasn't an, unless I fully allowed the emotional experience with an openness to what, to what the truth may be, not an attachment to what it is, that I would come to truth mm -hmm. and it would be a process and not a single event that would, that would bring me to a firm conclusion. And um, that's certainly what has happened and is happening. And, and it's that's only... what's happened for me too. Yeah. Like obviously because I began the process uh, much earlier than Mary has, I've had a lot more time in that process and so therefore I have a larger degree... You know, I have a degree of certainty. I have a certainty now. You're certain and you're articulate. And yeah, whereas, whereas if you'd asked me sort of five or six years ago when I was in the beginning of that process, then, you know, there were times when I went and cycled in the same manner that Mary has done in the past, you know? And there's been many times when I've just gone, no, this this can't be the truth. And, and I, it seems so bizarre <laughs> and so... Um, and fear is usually that those times. It's usually because we're, like in my case, when I was when I was afraid of what other people would think of me, yeah. and I was afraid of what they'd say, and I was afraid of being attacked, and I was afraid of you know being treated badly by my family and so forth. And um, you know, then I would prefer to not to not say anything about who I am. And you know, I decided I went through a period of time to decide I just want to live alone in in the woods somewhere and just leave the whole issue alone. You know, and that has really been my desire. Mm. Like, babe, I'm okay. I love this path. It's wonderful. Can we talk to everyone about this? What we about God and and how to connect to God and yourself? But could we just not talk about who we are? And a little while ago, I realised that there's an issue of truth involved. <laughs> you know, I, how am I being honest with you if I sit and tell you all those things and guard this belief that I have inside of me from mm -hmm. you? Uh, immediately, I'm setting up a, um, a sense of dishonesty about who I am. And so this is really what has um, made me um, take the step to be more public about my experience um, because certainly I've had a lot of fear about that as well mm. um, and a fear that maybe I can't trust myself <laughs> and, and AJ's certainly not 
reassuring. He's like, well, no, you've got to trust yourself. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't. Um, I don't feed. Uh, see, a lot of people believe that that I somehow feed Mary all of these things and then Mary has to believe that to be with me. It's actually yeah. quite the opposite. No. Like, Mary's had to go through her own experience and every time she tries to involve me in it, I say, babe, it's your experience. You've got to work your way through <laughs> you know, who you are. I don't have to work my way through who you are. I already think I know who you are. <laughs> like, I already feel who you are. Um, you've got to work through that. And, um, and so for that reason, it's quite a, it's quite a personal experience until, until, and the more you embrace that personal experience, the closer you get to the truth, like whatever the truth is, yeah. if, even if it's not if we, and you know even yeah. if we if we weren't Mary and Jesus then that truth would become exposed through this process and and I f I believe that very strongly and I said to someone recently um you know really I'm living um in integrity in what I believe and I'm very conscious of what is love and and where I'm in error around love I'm speaking as honestly and openly as uh, as my soul allows right now. If at some time, and I can't imagine, but if at some time in the future it became revealed, like it, it was exposed to me through my own experience or through, yeah, through my own experience that I am not Mary Magdalene, I would spend double the amount of time that I've spent speaking to people about that fact to correct that error because I have no desire to be someone that I'm not and I have no desire to mislead people about that um, so I, I take it very seriously and um, because I feel it's an issue of love just as my being open with you about what I feel is an issue of love if I um, then felt something else and I'd misled you or I'd communicated with you in a way that wasn't true I'd really want you to to learn about that um, yeah yeah I don't know if I'm articulating that well but no, that's, that, no, yeah. that's good yeah. hmm. All right. Well, thank you very much we, we, you, we could probably go on forever <laughs> we'll have to stop at some stage yeah. Um, yeah well thank you very much for um, just for the benefit of the uh, the uh, tape there you two don't know me from a bar of soap <laughs> This no. is not something no. you set up. No. no. I've come out of my own uh, interest and fascination with you, yeah. and you've welcomed me into your compound, <laughs> which doesn't look much like a compound, and you've uh, fed me lunch, and, uh, and you're very... Uh, I very much appreciate you, so yeah. thanks very yeah. much. Thanks, Thank you, Jeff. It's yeah. lovely to meet you, and yeah. uh, I'm glad that we took the opportunity to get to know you as yeah. well. Yeah, we, look, we like catching up with all new faces, eh? Yeah. And, uh, and we don't feel much fear about doing so generally. So, um, yeah, yeah. We, we enjoy the process of... Well, I could have been an axe-wielding murderer. You never know. You, <laughs> well, I, you, you trusted. I trusted. And I trusted also my feeling from <laughs> your email. So. Yeah, we, we, don't, we sort of feel like... We, we, we feel that we can fairly easily feel people's real condition. And, and so, therefore, we feel there's not much to fear. You know what I mean? Like you, I'm not really that scary. Uh, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> no. There, and even when we've had others come to do interviews, we haven't. You know, we can still feel their condition and what their intent is. And and the way we see the interview process is, we're happy to give an interview, and what the person does with that interview is totally up to them. Like we we don't have any control over it as you can see we now record it as well mm. um, and that's only for our own uh, record's sake because what we've found in the past is we've made an agreement with many interviewers um, and then they've reneged on that agreement to provide us with the actual raw footage of the interview it's so. also about having a historical record of of who we are and where we're at right now mm. like uh, we're starting to be prompted and realised that uh, that perhaps that's worth us keeping a record of as mm. well and, and so mm. yeah. That that's why we do it. Yeah. Yeah. But it's good to meet you my friend. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You too. You're welcome to come out anytime you want. Thank yeah. you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I might just take you up on that. <laughs>